When Saul dies, Simon is in physics class, drawing concentric circles meant to represent the rings of an electron shell, but which, to Simon, mean nothing at all. With his daydreaming and his dyslexia, he has never been a good student, and the purpose of the electron shell, the orbit of electrons around an atom's nucleus, escapes him. In this moment, his father bends over in the crosswalk on Broom Street while walking back from lunch. A taxi honks to a stop. Saul sinks to his knees. The blood drains from his heart. His death makes no more sense to Simon than the transfer of electrons from one atom to another. Both are there one moment and gone the next. Faria drives down from college at Vassar, Daniel from SUNY Binghamton. None of them understand it. Yes, Saul was stressed, but the city's worst moments, the fiscal crisis, the blackout, are finally behind them. The unions saved the city from bankruptcy, and New York is looking up. At the hospital, Varya asks about her father's last moments. Had he been in any pain? Only briefly, says the nurse. Did he speak? No one can say that he did. This should not surprise his wife and children, who are used to his long silences. And yet Simon feels cheated, robbed of a final memory of his father, who remains as close-lipped in death as he was in life. Because the next day is Shabbat, the funeral takes place on Sunday. They meet at Congregation Tefereth Israel, the conservative synagogue of which Saul was a member and patron. In the entryway, Rabbi Chaim gives each gold a pair of scissors for the Kriya. No, I won't do it, says Gertie, who must be walked through each step of the funeral as if through the customs process of a country she never meant to visit. She wears a sheath dress that Saul made for her in 1962, sturdy black cotton with a fitted waistline, front button closure, and detachable belt. You can't make me, she adds her eyes darting between Rabbi Chaim and her children, who have all obediently slit their clothes above the heart. And though Rabbi Chaim explains that it is not he who can make her but God, it seems that God can't either. In the end, the rabbi gives Gertie a black ribbon to cut, and she takes her seat with wounded victory. Simon has never liked coming here. As a child, he thought the synagogue was haunted— with its rough, dark stone and dank interior. Worse were the services, the unending silent devotion, the fervent pleas for the restoration of Zion. Now Simon stands before the closed casket, air circulating through the slit in his shirt, and realizes he'll never see his father's face again. He pictures Saul's distant eyes and a mere, almost feminine smile. Rabbi Chaim calls Saul magnanimous, a person of character and fortitude. But to Simon, he was a decorous, timid man who skirted conflict and trouble, a man who seemed to do so little out of passion that it was a wonder he had ever married Gertie, for no one would have viewed Simon's mother, with her ambition and pendulum moods, as a pragmatic choice. After the service, they followed the pallbearers to Mount Hebron Cemetery, where Saul's parents were buried. Both girls are weeping, Varya silently, Clara as loudly as her mother, and Daniel seems to be holding himself together out of nothing more than stunned obligation. But Simon finds himself unable to cry. Even as the casket is lowered into the earth, he feels only loss, not of the father he knew, but of the person that Saul might have been. At dinner, they sat at opposite ends of the table, lost in private thought, the shock came when one of them glanced up and their eyes caught. An accident, but one that joined their separate worlds like a hinge before someone looked away again. Now, there is no hinge. Distant though he was, Saul had allowed each gold to assume their separate roles. He, the breadwinner, Gertie, the general, Varya, the obedient oldest, Simon, the unburdened youngest. If their father's body his cholesterol lower than Gertie's, his heart nothing if not steady, had simply stopped. What else could go wrong? <laughs>